Run, I'm doing what I'm moving. Judge, I saw from looking at your huh? sure. you had some information yeah. that you had a connection to the Ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot. Why is that North uh, Carolina? Right. Was Coming that, to our yeah, event today. Summer home or, or don't some other? On the board of the YWCA. Uh, my name is Randy Weinston, and I'm a member of the American Constitution Society, one of the groups in addition to the program in public law and the Duke Bar Association that is sponsoring this event. Before I talk a little bit about our panelists, I just want to say that I am indeed saying very little about the scope of their accomplishments and, and activities. Joining us today uh, is Professor Paul Carrington, who will be serving as our moderator, who has spent a lot of time researching and thinking about the issue of electing judges, has been active in judicial reform efforts uh, regarding the selection and tenure of judges in state courts, and was the dean of Duke Law School for 10 years. Um, uh, Mr. Colin Willoughby, Wake County District Attorney, has been the District Attorney for Wake County for more than 20 years and has also served as President of both the Wake County Academy of Criminal Trial Lawyers and the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys. Judge Boyce Martin of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals has served on the Federal State Jurisdiction Committee and the Judicial Conference of the United States in addition to being Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit for seven years. Judge Marsha Morey, District Court Judge for the 14th Judicial District in Durham County, has twice been elected District Court Judge. She also serves as Chair of the District Court Judges Committee on Juvenile Justice and has spent time working in the District Attorney's Office and was Captain of the 1976 U.S. Olympic Swim Team. <laughs> With that, I'll turn it over to Professor Carrington. Uh, this is a difficult problem we're asking folks to address today, and they're not going to be any easy answers. I was at a meeting of uh, judges and lawyers uh, a few years ago. I remember hearing a, a, the Chief Justice, as I recall, the Chief Justice of Montana declaring that there is no way to pick judges that's worth a damn. Uh, and uh, I think he had it right. Uh, there's not any really good way to pick judges, and I think the problem is similarly can be said of uh, uh, of prosecutors. We want them to be, we want our judges to be independent, we want our prosecutors to be independent, but independent of what is a kind of question to which we don't have a, a, a very solid answer. And, and most people, if you were asking about it, would all say, well, yeah, we want independence, but we'd also think, you know, there ought to be some accountability. Uh, if, if judges or prosecutors make a big mess, what are we going to do about it? And who's going to do anything about it? Uh, that's the other side of the question. Uh, the, the part of it that I have been particularly involved in in recent years has been trying to figure out a way to, to finance uh, political campaigns for judges in state Supreme Courts, which have become, that's become a very serious problem in a lot of states. M many, the United States Chamber of Commerce was spending as much as $50 million a, a biennium on judicial state Supreme Court judicial elections. Uh, and never mind the other uh, contributors, but I mean, that, that's just one measure. And it, there are some states in which it's more expensive to get elected to the state Supreme Court than it is to get elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, there's something a little screwy about that, but uh, that is uh, the state of the arts. And so we've tried experimenting with a little public funding in North Carolina for the candidates for the state Supreme Court, but I, and it, it's sort of doing okay in the short term. but. Uh, the long-term prognosis for it is not entirely uh, uh, reassuring. So uh, that's my experience, and I can tell you it's a tough problem because the people can't come to very much agreement about how you get an appropriate measure of accountability in these public offices. How, what, do you, what do you expect people to do, and how do you expect to make sure they do it? Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, uh, our prosecutor here to uh, explain how prosecutors ought to be selected. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, my name's Colin Willoughby. Um, uh, excuse me, Colin. I that's right. I, 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 when I get introduced in great slides, I used to tell people I was a district attorney, but now I just tell them I'm a child molester. I get less heckling. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but it's um, <laughs> it uh, uh, but it is a, uh, an interesting issue, and, and Professor Carrington is a very um, he's modest in, in the efforts that he has done to, to look at this from a lot of different angles, and I think that's a, um, this is really a, a thorny issue. Um, I, district attorneys in North Carolina are elected. We're elected for four-year terms. We run in partisan elections. We run uh, 
almost all of them run in the even numbered years when there is not a presidential or gubernatorial election um, with other local officials and so we hopefully keep the focus on local things but uh, it does raise some some serious issues about you know what we ought to do um, and uh, some of the same problems that plague judicial elections plague prosecutorial elections from lack of, of public uh, understanding of what we do, lack of public understanding of who we are, um, lack of funding to get any type of message out in an electoral process. Uh, you have s the same type of problems with an appointment process of how do people get selected. Um, now I think one of the things that we all need to recognize is that the public by and large doesn't get very invested in the judicial selection process. They only get selected when uh, a prosecutor or a judge uh, doesn't behave in a way that they find appropriate or acceptable uh, and they express concern or outrage but generally expect us to be down there to do a job um, but to be more dignified and to not be involved in some of the raucous of electoral politics and um, kind of an example of, of the way the public looks at us I mean I, I dare say if you go on this uh, out on the street out in Durham today or Raleigh that you, you interviewed folks, probably one in five could tell you three people that are on the Supreme Court. Um, probably four out of five could tell you all three of the three stooges. And, you know, that probably gives a, an indication into where people's focus is, that they're just not focused on um, judicial election or selection or who holds those positions or what they do. Um, I believe that... that for the, the selection, whatever selection process you use is going to be um, subject to to not working smoothly and perfectly, but um, it, it, the, I tend to favor generally the electoral process for local officials like prosecutors and local trial judges. I think uh, appellate judges, we probably need a, a selection process that um, either through some type of merit selection or gubernatorial appointment with retention elections, but it's uh, the same kinds of forces that exist in the electoral process with, with putting large sums of money um, in it. Also put large sums of money in the elections of those people that make the selection, whether it's the governor or the president of the United States, uh, the interest groups and the individuals, and they expect to have some voice, and so I think it's just trading one brand of politics for another, whether it's you know, labor unions or chamber of commerce or trial lawyers or whatever group that provides the funding in an uh, electoral process, we're subject to those issues. We're also subject to them in the appointment process. You know, we've seen publicly what happens when we, in our federal system with the appointment of United States attorneys and the, um, we've seen uh, on television what happens in the judicial confirmation process that uh, over the last 10, 15 years, it has become um, very partisan and bitter and um, uh, probably makes people shy away from the process of good judges that we need to draw in. So um, as a general rule, I favor the electoral process, and we can talk about specific things and questions, but the, for local elected folks and, and some sort of appointment process for appellate folks. Judge, well... Uh, we, uh, we got two judges here. I, I'll, we'll go in order here. Uh, right. Judge Martin, you're sitting uh, next, and uh, give us the federal view here. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not so sure. I can. <laughs> my views are certainly my own personal views, but they are yeah, somewhat well, more. Of course. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it, that the whole process has become far more of a problem than any of us are willing to recognize. That is, what relevancy does the judiciary really have in our society today? At the local level, which is where most politics take place, as Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics are local. And the local issues are the police court, the family court, the issues that relate to individuals. Uh, the problems that I've seen, at least in the area, I live in Kentucky, I ran, uh, three times in general elections, once in a primary. In the primary, I won the Republican primary, the Democratic primary, and the Independent primary. But I still had to run in the fall again. Uh, and 
<laughs> in my judicial, early judicial career, I was a trial judge, and then I started the state, um, became the first chief judge of the state court of appeals, and that was foreseen as a need. Now, in North Carolina, they came somewhat after we did in starting an intermediate appellate court, but the intermediate appellate courts generally are far less partisan and far less um, politically driven because they are generally error-correcting courts. The big issue, and I think in the country as a whole, are the state Supreme Courts. In California, you had uh, three justices who were turned out of office. Tennessee has had the same situation. In Kentucky, uh, we had a woman who was appointed to the state Supreme Court, then defeated in the fall when the campaign ran a group of ads uh, by her opponent, which has been authorized by the free speech provisions that the Supreme Court has mucked up good. And that is that everything she did would relate to putting women in power in East Kentucky. Now, in East Kentucky, women in power not looked upon with a great deal of favor. Uh, and she was soundly defeated in the race for the state Supreme Court, but came back the next year and was elected to the Court of Appeals with the help of a great infusion of money from a lot of outside sources in the urban areas of Kentucky giving to that part of the state. Uh, I have friends in Texas, uh, which is what Dean Carrington was talking about. They spent more than $5 million to run for the state Supreme Court. A couple of them have paid that, spent that much and lost. Uh, Michigan, we've seen a lot of money spent in the partisanship of those courts. I think what the problem has developed is that many of the social issues that affect society today are unanswerable. We don't have a way of dealing with the problems that we as a society face. Poverty, uh, edu educational opportunity, economic opportunity. I don't think we're prepared for that. People turn to the courts in large measure for the role that used to be performed by ministers, uh, family doctors, uh, family friends. Um, for example, when I first started out in the judiciary, uh, the significant cases involved torts, in many cases, exploding tires, automobile accidents. Uh, then it, we had securities cases and so forth. Uh, I just sat in Cincinnati, Ohio last week as a circuit judge. I'm still an active circuit judge and have been for way too long, probably, but for almost 30 years. And we had 100 cases. We heard 26 of them orally. Um, I had appointees from other political points of view. Uh, but it's a little bit like everything else. We agreed on all but three or four cases. Uh, the cases that we disagreed on were primarily uh, not philosophical, but on just our approach to what the role of the judiciary should be. Part of that has come about is because the cases themselves are of so, such insignificant real value. Uh, most of them were immigration, Sentencing guidelines, ERISA claims for plant closings is very predominant in my part of the world. Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky all have enormous labor forces that have been turned out by companies that have either closed or gone out of business and have left their employees without health care or, or other questions. Um, the criminal work, um, the guidelines are an absolute disaster in the federal system. I mean, it doesn't work. We're sending people... Uh, to penitentiaries for 10 and 15 years for modest amounts of, of drugs. Um, the kiddie porn cases are driving us absolutely crazy. Uh, I had a case of a 25-year-old just last week, uh, 25 years in a federal penitentiary for possession of um, child pornography on a computer. To me, that's a society with a death wish. We're making a big, big mistake if we're going to... We have a penitentiary in Rochester, Minnesota with just... <coughs> College graduates, postgraduates, doctors, lawyers, the best educated people that we can find are in the federal penitentiary near Rochester, Minnesota. Why is that? Well, Ro the Rochester is the home of the Mayo Clinic. Many of these people volunteer to be part of drug tests. So maybe we're doing something. But then the, the Congress just cut out all the money for it. So we have a penitentiary full of intellectual people with basically very little to do. And we get back to what we were really talking about as electing or not electing judges. Um, the confirmation process on the national level, 
The people that are confirmed always bitch about how they were treated. The people that aren't confirmed never complain very much because they are not confirmed. Now, Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit, matter of fact, just gave a speech a few days ago in Arkansas complaining about the process of his confirmation. Well, he's confirmed and sitting on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, I think he's got nothing to complain about. If he's there, why is he complaining? I think Congress does play a role in the federal confirmation process as the electorate plays a role, as the uh, district attorney said, at the local level. I think the mores of a community have to be in part reflected in, if not among the judiciary, among the prosecutors and how, what cases the prosecutor feels are important. The prosecutor can go out and say, this year, uh, my goal is to reduce um, drug use in the neighborhoods uh, by 20 percent. And, and when he runs again in four years, he can come back and use the same example. Judges, on the other hand, are doing the same thing, but where they don't have that much influence in the end, because if the prosecutor doesn't bring the case, then certainly it's not going to make much difference where their beliefs are. And so we are, in my view, struggling uh, from the United States Supreme Court, for example, only decided 68 cases last year. I decided I participated in at least 1,000. Um, there's some distribution of the workload that seems to be out of kilter here. Uh, and I don't know what it is. I don't think the Supreme Court cases have the bell ringing merits. Uh, they've only taken some 38, 39 for this year uh, that we had a Supreme Court in the past that took as the issues of the day. Uh, Professor Kerrigan and I were talking earlier, not a single one on the Supreme Court today has ever run for public office, as a judge or anything for that matter. And so we have an elite group of people who in many of the opinions, and just a matter of fact in the Texas redistricting case, which relates I think as much to elected judges as anything, is the district from which an elected judge comes from is very important if he is to, or she is to reflect the mores of the community. Uh, but that opinion, which turned into some 68 pages, of, I found to be mostly gobbledygook. I still don't understand what they're driving in. Uh, now, and if I'm sitting in cases like I do in Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky, I've sat on uh, redistricting cases in all four states. Our opinions are basically four pages long, and what's, this is what you need to do. Um, I think we're confusing, and I think that that leads to a public that right now uh, can, as, as the district attorney said, I use the example of the Pew Charitable Trust interview of the 4,000 interviewees for a political question. They also ask them, can you name the nine justices on the Supreme Court? More people could na name uh, the seven dwarves over the justices on the Supreme Court. And in matter of fact, there were of the 4,000, some 2,000 that could not name a single person currently sitting on the Supreme Court. So we've certainly lost our impetus to be influential. I think we've lost our relevancy, and we have to retake it in some fashion. I'm not sure where we're going to start. Judge? Good afternoon. If you all have finished your lunch, you can go. I'm just the district court judge in Durham. But it's interesting. I think if you go out on the sidewalk and you talk to people in the mall or on the sidewalk in Durham, they, you ask them to name one district court judge, they probably could. And as a trial judge, the district court judge, I think it's fabulous that we do elect our judges in North Carolina, one of 21 states that elects the judges, and yet people know virtually nothing about them unless you had a traffic court case, they were okay, they gave you a low fine, you walked on your way, they're there at court on time. But judges are the most important officials that are elected in this state that address the most intimate details of a person's life. I mean, we vote for senators and congressmen and mayor and city council for sewer bonds and sidewalks, and they go out and they give their campaign spiels and they shake the hands, and you know where they stand. But when it comes to vote for that judge, whether it be district court or superior court, appellate court, supreme court, voters go by names for the most part. And so how do we select the best judges that are going to handle the most sensitive issues 
What do I do all day? I decide if a child's going to go home or going to go to a training school for two years. I decide if a man who had just fathered a child is going to be paying $200 of child support a month or go to jail. I decide the custody of three little kids on whose parents have just divorced. I decide, as I did 20 minutes ago, if the woman came to the door, had a phone or a gun in her hand with the wife of the person who was sleeping with her husband in her bed. You know, I mean, these are directly impacting the daily lives of individual people. So do we want the best people sitting on that court? I'd say so. And how do we do it? And I agree totally with Mr. Willoughby. I think trial court judges should be held accountable to their community. I'm on the district court level, the lowest trial court level. And yes, do I get worried about the politics of things? And I'll tell you a story. You used to Google my name. I mean, nobody would, but if they did, a year ago, it would come up uh, appointed by Governor Hunt, juvenile justice, teen court, volunteers in the school, maybe, you know, was defeated by the East Germans in the 76 Olympics, which I'm glad that's gone down the list. <laughs> but today, if you Google my name, it comes up the first page is Judge Morey advocates lying in a courtroom. And why was that? Because I was subpoenaed to testify for Mike Nifong's case before the state bar in his contempt hearing. I worked for him, with him, for 10 years. They subpoenaed me. I talked about how I knew him as a DA. But so many bloggers didn't like the fact I took a witness stand and I said I believed he was honest when he was a DA when I worked for him. My name is now totally trashed as a district court judge. Am I going to face that when I have to go up for re-election? Maybe, but that's okay. So electing judges for people that don't really come into the courthouses that much, you do worry about what's out there in the media, on the blogs, in the papers. Um, I think it's important to look at the difference of trial court judges and our appellate courts and Supreme Court. There was an appellate court judge who was named, appointed by Governor Easley. She had to immediately run in the next election cycle to keep her seat. The day she was sworn in, people said there's a campaign event over in Wilmington. You've got to go to it. She didn't even, hadn't had a chance to unpack her office, look at the cases in front of her, ready for oral argument in a couple days, demanding she get on that campaign trail. She ran and ran and ran while she was trying to do 16 hours of work at the Court of Appeals. She lost. As soon as she lost, she was reappointed to a different seat that became open. She's running again, day in, day out, trying to hold down a, an appellate court job. It's brutal. And do we want that judge to be running as hard as she can to keep her seat or doing the best job she can on the Court of Appeals? That's a real dilemma. Another court of appellate judge appointed by Governor Hunt, Al Thomas, from Wilson, he started working 18-hour days, driving from Wilson to Raleigh every day. He was up to run for re-election. And after a month on the campaign trail, when he never saw his kids, didn't see his wife, cases getting behind, he said, forget it. I am not doing this. I'm going to fill out my term, do the best I can do as an appellate judge, but I'm not going through this political process. And it's interesting, if you look at the ballots in North Carolina, when people are asked to vote for statewide elections, and they have the governor and the lieutenant governor and the superintendent of education, and you drop down to Supreme Court, appellate court, a half a million people stop voting because they have no idea who they're voting for. Many people in North Carolina think I, Beverly Lake, won the chief justice seat of the Supreme Court because his middle name was Beverly and they thought they were voting for a woman. We have judges in North Carolina whose name is Kim and they'll have a picture of their family and no one knows if they're voting for the woman sitting there or the man sitting there and they'll vote. And recently women have done well. I mean we have what I think seven out of 15 of our court of appellate judges are women. 
But I think the statewide demands to run a statewide election for Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, is an atrocity because they're not doing the jobs that they have to do while they're running statewide campaigns. <coughs> do I worry about re-election? Yes. I put a city councilman in jail two years ago. Well, rumors start flying. You're going to have competition. They're going to run against you because it was, an, um, you know, a well-known person that a lot of his supporters didn't like me putting him in jail. But the rumors subside, and I've not been uh, opposed now in my third term uh, as a district court judge. And I'm gratified for that. Does it worry me? Yes. Do the blogs worry me? Yes. But I am accountable, I think, to the best people who are the voters. North Carolina's come a long way. I think we've made great strides. We're not running as Republican or Democrat. It's nonpartisan. When I go out, what can I talk about? I can't talk about, well, I believe in parental waiver of rights for abortion. You know, you can't talk about that. You talk about who you are, you try and get away on your good looks. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, but I think you're accountable to the community to be fair, to be impartial, to be courteous, to be on time, to do the job the best way you know how. And I have a good day when I go home and I think half the people are happy with what I did and half the people are angry. That's a good day. You go down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, uh, one question that came to my mind in light of the conversation is really a prosecutorial question. You, you uh, well, we've had some publicity in the last uh, year or so about uh, Democratic prosecu Republican prosecutors going after uh, Democrats uh, to uh, put them in jail or at least uh, embarrass or humiliate them. Uh, is there any way of holding prosecutors accountable for that kind of conduct? How do you, what, what, what do we do to, to have nonpartisan decisions uh, in the prosecutor's office? Well, now this is on the national level you're talking about. Well, it happens on the national level, but I assume yeah, it's also a problem. Yes, sir. It, it, yeah. Uh, it, it's not limited in that respect. I, I was a U.S. attorney at one point, and uh, the irony was, this is back when Lyndon Johnson was president, so it gives you some idea of how long ago it was. But uh, most of the time in those days, and it, it, it goes all the way back to Herbert Brownell, who was the attorney general under Eisenhower, uh, every appointed U.S. attorney uh, who is confirmed by the Senate also tendered on his taking the oath of office a letter of resignation. And in my day, that was the traditional way we handled it. My staff, assistant prosecutors and all, did the same thing. In return for which, we were guaranteed that if we were called by any politician or any political issue came up, we were to report it immediately to the Attorney General. Now, I happen to have served under Nicholas Katzenbach, and I mean, that was one thing he said on the day I was sworn in. Uh, look, Boyce, uh, somebody calls you, you call me. We don't need to mess with that. Now, in the most recent spat of cases, much of this has turned on a lot of subterranean projects. One, for example, is Western Michigan, which happens to be in my circuit. Uh, the prosecutor, the U.S. attorney there, is a very fine, long-time practicing lawyer. Uh, the attorney general called her and told her she must start bringing death penalty cases, which in Michigan does not have a death penalty in federal criminal drug cases to ensure that the laws are enforced uniformly across the country. She said, Mr. Attorney General, I think you're dead wrong and stuck by our guns. In her case, she was fired because of that. Uh, but that's mainly because I know a lot about the circumstances. Many of these others were fired allegedly for involving themselves in pursuing political style cases. Um, that's a great danger in a democracy. The executive branch has a lot of freedom. I mean, it's going on right now. We're living in fear of a period that's now five years old. Uh, you see it every day. I had a case uh, where your email is not protected. I've got two cases right now. Uh, phone lines tapped without any authority, out any reporting. Uh, and colleagues of mine saying, well, we got to do it for national security. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that that's one of the things that integrity is what makes judging and prosecuting 
uh, important. And if the people who are holding those jobs do not have integrity, we're going to get what we deserve. Do you have any comments on that, Judge? No, 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 well, I think there is there there is uh, sometimes criticism, but um, some famous person said something about the the last vestige of a scoundrel is patriotism, and and sometimes when folks um, public officials get indicted, the first thing we want to say is they did this to me because of some reason, because of my political affiliation or the prosecutor's affiliation or some other reason rather than their own conduct. And um, for me, I've probably have have had the responsibility to prosecute more public officials in North Carolina than anybody who's done this job. I started in 1983 um, and had been there about four weeks when I submit a bill of indictment to the, the grand jury for the sitting lieutenant governor and since then have prosecuted commissioner of agriculture and the sec uh, speaker of the house and various other people. Most all of them have been Democrats, and I'm a Democrat, so... Um, <laughs> North Carolina has problems over there. Kentucky's bad, but it's not that bad. <laughs> We're sort of Louisiana light, you know. Um, we are... <laughs> but it's... Uh, but it is fun. It's inside work. It's no heavy lifting, and so it's, you know, it's not a bad job. But it, but that, Don't you know, go on with the Earl Butts joke. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it's, it is... Um, I think that the federal prosecutors have probably been um, here have probably had a little tinge of that where people have accused them because of a number of these, almost all of these prosecutions have been joint state federal investigations and um, and so it has helped blunt the, the criticism because you had a, a Republican United States attorney and a Democratic state prosecutor and so it's made it a little bit more difficult but there, there has been that but I think that um, usually that melts away and uh, most of that stuff becomes transparent and you can't get by doing that stuff very much. Um, but I think that we've, uh, I think that's a, a frequent defense of people that want to say, you're prosecuting me because of such and such a reason, but that, that usually doesn't hold water. Uh, you want to speak to this issue, Judge? No. No, okay. It's not, you're, you're not a prosecutor. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I should uh, see if we haven't got some questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. All of you spoke about the importance of having local communities impart their, their values and mores to their <coughs> local judges and prosecutors. And I wonder how that plays out in a community. Um, the smaller the community, the easier it is to, to have a bias or a prejudice or discriminatory feeling that is common among the people and the extent to which that does or can or ought or ought not play out in the electoral process, um, <coughs> especially um, in recent events considering the, the alleged statements of the district attorney in Gina, Louisiana, um, and the grand discretion that prosecutors have in charging conduct either more or less severely um, and that trial judges similarly have a broad range of discretion and that if we say it's those people at the most local level who are m maybe most easily influenced by the, the small insular community that might hold those prejudices, um, isn't that a case against election at that level and maybe appointment from a broader spectrum is a way to solve that. And I don't know, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Good question. You want um, to respond to it? I'll be brief. I think that prosecutors from small, rural, single county districts probably um, get much more intense pressure than people in the urban districts. I think it's much easier for me to to prosecute some socially or politically prominent person in a county of 780,000 people than it is if you go to Halifax County where there are 60,000 people and you prosecute someone who's socially or politically prominent their friends and cousins and relatives um, uh, try to run you out of town. And I think that it is. I think one of the ways that North Carolina has insulated itself is that in mo many of our rural districts, they're multi-county districts. So it might be three, four, five, as many as seven counties in a district. So it helps blunt that. But I do think that there is intense pressure in small, um, sparsely populated communities. And it's a uh, 
it, it's a tougher job than it is sometimes in the big city. And I think, uh, speaking judicially, you're absolutely right, and, and, and there is that fear. Election of judges or appointment, I don't think either in and of itself is a great solution. I mean, somewhere. Illinois has an election, and then 60% of the voters need to do a retention. I like that better. We're starting to have more events in North Carolina. For instance, there's something called Court Watch. And in fact, I, uh, a bailiff gave me a survey. They're surveying specific districts, and they're asking all the bailiffs to fill out questionnaires about the judge. And the clerks fill out the questionnaires, and the attorneys. So there will be kind of a report card that will be available to the public. How well is this judge doing? Are they fair? Are they impartial? It's not so much do you agree with the verdict in anything, but are they being good at being a good judge? And I think things like that are really needed because we do need a check and balance on what we're doing. The pressure to run for office every four years is bad. And, and how do you accept a $1,000 campaign contribution and then that attorney comes in front of you asking for leniency in a minor offense, you know? Does that play in your mind? You hope not, but that appearance of impropriety, especially in smaller areas, I think that weighs very heavily. So I think we need a more informed uh, electorate and we need more uh, accountability through like court watches. Uh, does the uh, size of the community affect uh, uh, rulings? We juries, of course, have the same problem as the as the judge, but uh, there is a sort of general expectation that there will be xenophobia in a in a small uh, county. And uh, does it play out in, uh, for example, uh, the kind of family matters you do? Uh, would, would you uh, never mind your own court? But I mean, would you be uh, mistrustful of uh, the uh, decision being made by a family court judge in a, in a small community where one of the parents is not resident and one is? Uh, well, you might have the concern, but there are the safety nets, you know, of the appeals and the appellate court review. and. Uh, but I, I think if you're a good judge, it's going to make you just, you know, make sure you got the blinders on, you're following the law, you're following, you know, the arguments. They're going to be good and bad wherever you go, but it's mm -hmm. a good question. Yeah. Judge Murray, um, your remarks about uh, electing local <laughs> trial court judges made me think of the question, but the question is for everyone. What about um, federal district court judges? I mean, nobody really, unless I missed that, nobody really spoke about that in particular. And I guess I'm just curious, do you think that the process is working or do you think that they need to be tied and held accountable to the communities in which they sit, um, similar to uh, local trial court judges? Well, I'll try to answer that. Uh, there are about 750 federal district judges across the United States. Uh, there are another almost 200 senior district judges across the United States. Currently, the trials in those 900 or so judges, uh, if they have three trials a year, it's a big year right now. Uh, charge uh, pleading is the crucial part of a criminal defense attorney's life right now. They've got to get to the U.S. attorney before there's been an indictment and before the agent gets to the assistant U.S. attorney assigned to the case. So 90% of the federal drug cases now that across the United States, there are maybe 100,000 a year, are being disposed of by plea. Um, we have a process within the federal judiciary for the uh, reprimanding of federal district judges. Uh, one case is out of Texas just recently. This was a discriminatory act and a harassment by a federal district judge in Galveston, Texas. Uh, I happen to have been on the Sixth Circuit activities when we went through the process, so I know what they did. They had a hearing, they had a trial, they reprimanded him to the extent they can without impeachment. Federal district judges and circuit judges are appointed for life. Uh, most of my colleagues think they were anointed for life, but I mean, I've always looked upon it as a as an appointment, and many judges I think that I work with feel the same way. It gets back to the point of integrity. If you have a belief in the integrity of the person appointed, for example, most of the federal district judges now being nominated by the current president and now being confirmed are former federal prosecutors or state judges. 
very few from outside and into the real world. Now, accountability, uh, that's what a court of appeals is for. Uh, we've had, uh, during my tenure as chief judge, there were two district judges that were reprimanded and suspended from uh, sitting for a year. The chief judge of the circuit has the authority to remove their docket, which the chief judge of the fifth circuit in the case of the Galveston judge just did. Uh, we have worked for years to get Congress to listen to a plan and a program whereby judges can in fact control our own uh, non-complying members. But the Congress has refused to do that. There's very, very little process. Um, there are a few around the country that I would say district judges uh, who need to be retired early. Uh, but there again, you've got a problem. When I was the chief judge, what I did was hire uh, a group of um, geriatric psychologists. Now, you'll ask why geriatric psychologists. Well, I learned a lot of lessons from the fact that an older person needs <laughs> sometimes someone to tell them, look, it's time to go. And I worked on a process which we've used in a case, because none of us have to quit. We're paid for life. We have a job. we got an office. We can keep it forever. In the Southern District of New York, there's so many uh, black offices when you go through the federal courthouse there, because there's almost 100 judges in that building. And virtually no one's doing much work. Yeah. Now, if you're asking me, are they judged by what they do as judges, or are you asking me what they're doing, judging it by what the com company, country is paying them? I think those are two big different questions. And right now we are unwilling and do not seem to care enough to really do something about it because we are poor sellers of our own positions and we're poor sellers of the fact that we need to have these questions addressed. But it is, again, it's back to what I said, it's local. I mean, the local judges, local prosecutors, and local selection processes are what really count. Yeah. Um. It seems that one of the key difficulties in a judicial election paradigm is that, as all of you, I think, mentioned, uh, there is very little voter attention to um, judicial elections and the context of other elections and just in general a lack of information available to voters. Uh, I wonder if there are, if you think that there are any realistic possibilities for increasing the, the prominence of judicial elections in the context of the, the political process in general, and if particularly there are ways to do that uh, and hopefully promote the right uh, set of criteria for choosing judges, uh, you know, <coughs> one, can we increase the prominence of those elections so that people may actually know the names before they get into the voting booth, and then if we can do that, can we increase the prominence in a way that people are making their decisions on bases that we think are appropriate rather than on uh, highly politicized or other issues that might may be irrelevant to the judiciary as opposed to other branches of government? I think that there's a little. Oh, go ahead. I, I, th I think that there's. I think it's difficult to do that because I, I just don't think you can. It, the, the public doesn't spend much time thinking about the courts and what we do except for the sensational cases and when something goes wrong. And that we're largely sort of like Antarctica. Everybody knows we're down there, nobody cares. It, um, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, the, the whole idea is that, that if you raise those things, I, th I think that there are lots of people that like it the way it is. I think that one of our problems, I believe, in the election of judges is campaign finance problems. You know, the United States Supreme Court has equated free speech and money. And I think that, while it's a great libertarian idea, it, it wreaks havoc on the local level. I mean, it means that, you know, Bill Gates has the loudest voice in America, or, you know, somebody like George Soros has, has a disproportionate voice to the people that may be voting in the district. Uh, and, and so I think that unless we have significant campaign finance reform that uh, takes um, serious money out of it and requires judges and prosecutors to be involved in their community, to be responsive to people in the community. Those are the things I think that will make for a better election process. And I, I don't think we can do it just by writing more articles about our judges. Uh, if you're going to elect judges, it makes sense to, to have some kind of public finance scheme. I mean, that's the, does help. 
uh, and uh, you can create some disincentives to other people to try to spend money. But among the problems are the 527 organizations who, who uh, are entitled to go out and spend money, uh, and, and it's kind of hard to regulate that in any, uh, at the local level. Uh, they have federal uh, status under the federal income tax, so you can contribute. It's, it's a tax-deductible contribution to public education. They're going to educate people about how, what a lousy judge uh, uh, this judge is because she was a witness in a case that, uh, I mean, that, that's the sort of public education they can spend money on, and it's pretty hard to control that uh, uh, at the local level. Not hard. It's, it's impossible at the local level to control it. So. Uh, money is a is a is a big part of the problem. But the other thing the judge suggested, uh, trying to give people a an evaluation of judges makes a great deal of sense. And there are a number of states now that are, have advanced that considerably. And there's talk about trying to develop a system in North Carolina for evaluating the appellate judges uh, in a professional sort of way, and then telling people what what they ought to know about it. But the basic problem is is the a level of attention, and uh, I uh, I've been told by an economist you have to think about it how much how much effort is it really worth on the part of an average individual voter to figure out who I ought to be for with regard to a particular election campaign, and if you think about it in those economic terms, you can understand why people are sort of indifferent. You know, I'm just one of 100,000 people who are going to cast a vote, and I don't really know what I'm talking about, even if I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to figure it out. So uh, long ballots, which we have in North Carolina and elsewhere, are a serious problem. But yeah. this, this is an issue that Richard Posner, the judge on the Seventh Circuit, has written extensively about. Uh, what's the economic value of your vote? And the economic value of your vote, if it doesn't affect you, is zero. And uh, I, I agree. I mean, around the United States now, CASA, which is a voluntary group that has been watching, in many cases, the family courts and children's ca cases involving children. Uh, they're now court watchers, which are being organized in many states. I, I would say that in the Midwest, most of the cities have at least for local judges almost a yearly uh, polling of lawyers and citizens and so forth to get some feel for what uh, the local judges are doing or not doing. The big problem, and I recognize it, and I think it, it's, it's one of those that we don't have any solution for, it's virtually impossible to take an appellate judge and really, if he does it, his or her job on a regular basis, uh, you cannot use things like reversal rates, which is what happened in many of the states where we have elected appellate judges. Uh, reversal rates by the state Supreme Court have defeated more Court of Appeals judges and intermediate appellate courts in this country than maybe one in any one single factor. Now, we're not talking about a lot, but we're talking about enough to make the system flawed. Now, here in North Carolina, I know that the, the intermediate appellate court started after mine started in Kentucky. And I was down here when it began, and from what I understood for the first eight or ten years, they really, uh, those who served on the court, I mean, there were very few defeats in those early years. But apparently now that's changed somewhat. And the campaigning, our state court of appeals are in districts, which makes your campaigning much simpler. And I think that, you know, if there's one thing North Carolina could do is make the court of appeals judges run from s defined districts with populations of equal size and do the same with the state Supreme Court justices as we do and other states have done. And that reduces the amount of direct uh, involvement of trying to sell someone in Asheville why someone in New Bern ought to be elected. And I think that's one of the big problems you have when you have these statewide elections. Uh, the states that have statewide Supreme Court elections, just Michigan, for example, right now, the interests who wanted to uh, tort reform groups and the United States uh, Chamber of Commerce poured millions of dollars into those Supreme Court races and changed the structure of the court. The court is now a dysfunctional group of individuals who have food fights with each other literally every day. They won't even sit at the same table uh, when, there's a, when there's a meeting. So, you know, that's another problem. I don't know how you deal with the uh, emotional uh, conflicts that judges can create for themselves, but. I think that's another phenomenon that no one is willing to address, but which is a growing problem around the United States. 
Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you could speak to the role of uh, individual lawyers could play in helping educate the public about um, judicial elections and, and what you've seen as successful or, or strategies that an individual practitioner might might take. Well, I'll begin by saying that Judicare Society, uh, when it began, and, and certainly back in my heyday, as I would call it, uh, and the American Bar Association were doing a great deal. They're not doing much today. Uh, I think lawyers find it very difficult to get on uh, uh, the bandwagon. And, and the change, too, is uh, when <laughs> I won't use Paul as that. Back when I started as a trial lawyer, uh, all of the big firm that I work for in Louisville, Kentucky, and everybody else, I mean, we tried a lot of cases. Uh, you had a lot of direct involvement with the judiciary. You, it was just a different standard. Today, my law clerks, when they leave me, go to firms. None of them, as far as I can tell, in the last 10 years have tried a case other than to go show up at a motion hour. Uh, there's very little litigation. Litigation in the federal courts has dropped almost 70% in the last 15 years. So the, those of you who practice law, it's got to be a much more cohesive uh, unit group discussion to improve the judiciary. I don't think individual lawyers, uh, I mean, I think it, it puts you out in a, in a position where it looks like you're pandering to the judge or pandering to the judiciary. Uh, we have a lawyer in Cincinnati, Ohio named Stanley Chesley, and if you talk about a panderer, he is the biggest panderer I've ever met, and he's made all his money in class action lawsuits. Matter of fact, two of his co-counsel are in the Boone County Jail right now. They happen to own the horse that won the, uh, the Breeders' Cup uh, big race on Saturday. Uh, they had a class action involving uh, Penfen, the diet drug. Uh, they collected for themselves $200 million in a legal fee, which the courts now think was pretty much out of touch. But I mean, People like that get the attention. They show up in all of the media. Uh, it's, I don't know what we've done, but we've certainly driven our constituency away from us. Um, last question, I think. Um, a couple of you have mentioned uh, retention as a potential reform. I'm just curious, with some of the issues that you've identified as problems with judicial elections, election, how do you retention elections <laughs> well, uh, does everybody understand what a retention election is? The idea is that the judge runs without an opponent, and the, the voters are given an opportunity to vote against retention of this judge. So uh, it's a solo thing. It was a device uh, created uh, in the early years of the 20th century by the American Judicature Society, was the principal promoter of it, uh, and it worked very well for a long time. Uh, it, in recent times, has uh, proved to be less uh, stable than it used to be, partly because people are willing to spend a lot of money on television advertising to malign a, a judge. And if you're seeking retention and somebody's going around saying ugly things about you and there's no opponent, you can't uh, very, you don't have a very effective defense. So there have been a number of uh, judges who have been not retained in, in the last 25 years, uh, and maybe some of them deserve not to be retained, but there are at least a few of them that were pretty scandalous situations in which they were thrown out of office for nothing uh, and for political reasons that were entirely partisan. Uh, and so it's not, it's not a perfect answer. Uh, if you have uh, sufficient other kinds of support from the bar, uh, then it, you know, it can be made perhaps to work better than some other things. It may be an improvement, but it's not risk-free. You know, what's interesting, the U.S. Constitution doesn't require election of judges, obviously, period. But the states, North Carolina Constitution requires election of judges. And if you look down several of the states, those that have election of judges have reforms to go to an appointive system. Those with retention elections are going to abolish them. It's almost like every state, whatever their constitution or laws are, they're wanting to reform. So it's almost the message is no one's happy. <laughs> I second that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there another question? Yeah. I I'm wondering um, if we keep. Would it work out if we kept at the trial level, federal would still be appointed, uh, state would still be elected, but then 
select appellate and Supreme Court judges from that by that. Do you think that would work out if, if the trial court judges actually were the ones who decided who staffed the appellate judge judgeships? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think that's politics at its very worst. I think if I happen to have been chosen as the final candidate from a group of five when uh, President Carter had in each of the circuits a judicial uh, nominating committee made up of prominent citizens from each of the states which made up that circuit. Now, whether I was the best qualified or not, I don't know. We, we'll leave that to, the, to history to talk about. But at least all five of us in my group had practiced law, had experience. I'd been the chief judge of a court of appeals. Others had been on state supreme courts. It was made up because of the record and our personal uh, integrity or whatever it was from which the president then chose one. Uh, it's much better. Judges are fiercely, um, how should I say it, fiercely prejudicial, to be honest. They tend to be angry with those with whom they don't agree. And they get a heat on sometimes that just, you won't believe it. So given the judges a role, other than a pro proposal that Professor Carrington has of being the cert pool for the United States Supreme Court, which I think would be a great idea, other than that, I don't think they're well qualified because they will look at, uh, they tend to look at things that don't really come into, an appellate judge is an error corrector. He's not rewriting the law. Most of us are trying to just get a case resolved. Uh, we leave it to the legislature to pass the statutes that we then interpret. We try and do that. I mean, we don't always succeed. Trial judges would want us to do, they'd want to appoint people that would be more <coughs> proactive, either negatively or, or positive. I mean, just for their point of view. And it would be hard to get a group of trial judges to agree on virtually anything, <laughs> in my view. Yeah. But I like an idea of an in independent judicial commission. And it may not be just composed of trial judges, but it may be political, two sides of the aisle. Uh, look internationally. I mean, even Iraq, I Afghanistan, they're setting up prejudicial training. You, you train not to be lawyers, or after that, you train to be judges. You know, internationally, they do that more than we do here. Is that an option? It could be. There is a committee of the, uh, that it's a joint committee of the North Carolina Bar and the uh, trial lawyers, North Carolina Academy of Trial Lawyers, that is working on a draft of a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment that uh, would uh, provide for a kind of selection process that uh, is a little different from merit selection because it, it we're trying to avoid that word because it has an elitist uh, air to it. but. The thing they're working on would make sure that the uh, committee that selected the people who would be considered for judgeships uh, would be a diverse group. Uh, there would be some women lawyers, some African American lawyers, any kind of organization of lawyers would be represented on that committee, and they would have an obligation to try to identify an appellate judiciary that in some measure reflected the population of the state. and. Uh, uh, how, whether that'll work or not, or actually whether we'll ever get it enacted, I don't know. But uh, uh, a lot of thought is given to it. It's a very important subject, and I would encourage everybody in this room, as you uh, leave this school and go out into the profession, to think seriously about what you can do to help. It's a, it, the problem doesn't have a good, clean, easy solution. It requires constant attention by uh, lawyers who have a stake in it. And th there are bar organizations everywhere that do try to do this, and they need more energy. They need more help. And uh, uh, the American Bar Association for a long time was playing an important role in the selection of federal judges. Uh, and uh, somewhere along the way, they got in trouble with uh, the... Uh, I guess actually it was the present administration that just threw them out and said, we're not going to listen to you guys anymore. Uh, but hopefully that can be brought back at some point. The ABA was performing a useful function, and uh, it's one that uh, requires political energy. It requires people to get, go out and get off their duffs and go do something about it, and you won't get paid for that kind of work. Uh, but uh, if you are uh, uh, at all uh, interested in your work and care about the courts, this is a field in which uh, 
uh, we, we can certainly use all the time and energy and wit and, and imagination that you have to try to help us deal with these kinds of problems. We've kind of neglect, neglected prosecutors a little in this conversation, and I'm not sure that everything we've said also applies to prosecutors. I want Are to there, thank you for that. Huh? I want to thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> there, there is no merit selection process for prosecutors. We're against merits. I mean, <laughs> no, there, there is not. It never has been. Yeah. Uh, there has been the, uh -huh. the president has, done, has had things selecting U.S. attorneys and yeah. that, but not on the state yeah. level. No. Yeah. Okay, well our time's up, but if anybody wants to hang around. <laughs>